news, disability news, it's news, the news, the news, disability news. On today's episode of Disability News, disabled comedian divides the disability community with ableist slur in documentary title. Britain's most inaccessible theme park fails disabled people again. Not just the ticket office, government plans to close 1,000 rail ticket offices, but what does this mean for the disability community? German Sesame Street gets a new character. Hello my wonderful friends and welcome back to a jam-packed episode of Disability News. If you have missed any of the previous series of Disability News, then I will leave them linked all down below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with a friend, and maybe consider giving me a super thanks. This segment contain ableist language that some viewers may find offensive. You may have seen that last week comedian Rosie Jones released a new documentary on Channel 4. The documentary takes a look at and highlights the ableism and the abuse that Rosie receives online as a disabled woman. But it sparked controversy when the title was revealed. Am I a... At first the title had no asterisk in it, but then they did decide to dampen it down a little bit with an asterisk. This title very much divided the disability community. I am going to remain very impartial here. I can actually see two sides to this argument. Working in media myself, I understand that you want to grab attention, you want to use shocking titles because that is what sells, that is what clicks, but at what cost? Now let's just dive into what the R word actually means. Now the R word is very damaging for pretty much everybody in the disability community and I would be surprised if there wasn't a disabled person out there who hasn't been on the receiving end of the R word. And let me tell you, it's not nice. But it is especially damaging for those with intellectual and learning disabilities. If we look back in history, mental retardation was actually the medical term for people with intellectual and learning disabilities. Having this diagnosis resulted in forced serialization, institutionalization, and discrimination. And that's why it's a slur. For many of us with disabilities, it's deeply hurtful and upsetting. We have been harassed and bullied and segregated with that word. Unfortunately, it's used quite a lot. I even came across it in one of my favorite movies, Mean Girls, the other day. What is quite shocking to understand is that three amazing disability activists and content creators were taking part in this documentary. We had Kate Stanforth, we had Lucy Dawson, and we also had Shelby, who has featured on the channel before. They did not want to be associated with that word and they had tireless conversations backwards and forwards with producers highlighting how this could damage and affect the disability community and the wider public by using this word in the title. After months of going backwards and forwards, they still wouldn't change the title. So these three creators withdrew from the documentary after putting a lot of work in. It really upsets me and shocks me that even when disabled people are at the centre of creating something for the mainstream media, they're still not listened to. We often see things online that may be ableist or we see campaigns that they haven't really thought of disability or disabled people and we think, oh well, if they had consulted disabled people, maybe this wouldn't happen. But seeing this, I think, well, maybe they did consult disabled people and they just didn't listen. I was having a little bit of a thought, I think, and reflecting about what has happened recently. I don't know if you remember, but we had the amazing artist Lizzo release a song a couple of years ago, which used the word, I'm a spaz. The disability community spoke out. We educated Lizzo. We told her why this is potentially damaging to the disability community. So listened and eliminated it from her song. We also have the amazing documentary, Crip Camp. 
I don't remember seeing much uproar about this title. I know that I personally didn't feel comfortable with it. I hate the word cripple and I hate the word crip and it makes me feel really sick if someone calls me that. I may have seen a couple of people talk about it but there wasn't a huge uproar about it. Rosie stood by what she believed in. I can only speak for myself. And I think by using it in the title, I am in no way encouraging people to use it. I am in no way trying to reclaim it. I am highlighting it as a word that is still used casually and it needs to stop. And the three disability activists who, took, who were taking part in the documentary, they stood by what they believed in. Disability is not linear, it's different for different people. Obviously, Rosie is talking about herself. In some ways, you could look at this as a very clever PR move. Whether that's hurt people or not, obviously the media is extremely cutthroat, but let's face it, I think more people have spoken about it than they would have if it was called something very mundane. But what do you think? Do you think Rosie should have changed the title? What do you think she could have changed it to? Or do you think, no, this is a good title, it's shocking, it's going to change things, hopefully people are going to see this and realise that it's not the word to be used. Now, some of you may notice Tony Huggle. He has not had the best start in life. He was actually abused by his birth parents and lost both of his legs. Since then, he was adopted by a lovely family who embraced Tony and let him do as much as possible. Tony lives an amazing, active lifestyle and nothing holds him back, like most disabled children, right? But when he went to Chessington with a group of friends for his party, he, him and his parents were shocked to discover that he couldn't go on any of the rides except for the baby carousel. Have we heard this before? You may remember that I made a video on Chessington and 1.6 million people were quite interested in this video. The shock and lack of disability access and the lack of disability awareness training I was told to get up out of my wheelchair and prove if I could or couldn't walk to access a ride in front of people like a performing monkey. <laughs> it was horrendous and I have since found out that not much has changed. In fact, it could have got a bit worse. People have been sharing their stories with me, you can pause to read. But the thing that really frustrated Tony and his parents was not the fact that he couldn't ride the rides, it was that they checked the accessibility information on their website and there was nothing on there telling them that their policies have changed, that you need to now have three working limbs to ride their rides. Tony, as I said, is a double amputee. Now, I've seen videos of Tony and he can run pretty fast on his stunts, he can walk pretty well on prosthetics, his mother reported that he can brace himself, he can get himself out of the roller coaster in an emergency evacuation, and there really was no need for him not to be able to ride those rides. So Tony was left segregated from the entire group for the entire day, which just breaks my heart, really, because I know how that feels. And it shouldn't be happening in 2023. Essington is absolutely horrendous when it comes to their disability access. I've even had reports where some people have sat with their board members and spoken about how they can make changes, nodding, saying, oh, yes, 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 and no changes have taken place. It's also important to point out that it is possible to make theme parks accessible for disabled people. Look at Disneyland. Look at Poulton's Park in the UK. You've just got to put the effort in. Why don't they want to listen? I've also heard that they have had two new rides installed that aren't wheelchair accessible. They just don't want to spend the money, but they can spend the money on the new rides. But let's not forget about the Purple Pound, which is the spending power of disabled people. That's 270 billion pounds a year. They are cutting out a lot of that income for their park and they're just getting more and more bad press. 
What do you think about Chessington's Disability Access Procedures? Do you think it's a good park to go to? Have you been recently? Do you hope that there will be change? I certainly know that, that Chessington is not top of my list. Now, this next story I found quite shocking, but it doesn't surprise me. What with all of the rising costs and people making cutbacks wherever they can. Now, the government are proposing to close a thousand railway ticket offices throughout the UK and this could really disproportionately hit disabled people. The government is proposing consolidating staff into multi-use roles. This will in turn save them money. Did you know that one in eight rail tickets are actually sold at a ticket office? These are often purchased by people who don't have access to the internet, they're cash users or unbanked, or they're disabled and older people. Now for the people who don't have access to the internet purchasing those tickets, 26% of those people are disabled, whereas only 6% are non-disabled. Disabled people have reported that if they are trying to buy a ticket online, they often don't have the feature to put in the wheelchair or the carer concession. Some people are just not cognitively able to purchase tickets online. I speak from experience there. I made a very expensive mistake when I bought tickets to Australia online and I inputted the wrong date because I am dyslexic. I would much prefer to speak to an actual person and get them to help me do it. Now not all automated ticket machines accept cash. Some of them don't have tactile braille and they're completely unaccessible for people with dexterity issues and are they gonna put in a lowered one as well? The whole process of using an automated ticket machine can be completely overwhelming for some people. And they just wanna to speak to a human. Quite often when you rock up to the ticket office, the person you see in there is your first point of contact. They can often help disabled people unlock toilets, unlock lifts, arrange accessibility accommodations and ramps onto the train. They can help with luggage. They can phone ahead to the station that you're going to to let them know that a disabled passenger is getting off at that station. If you take away the ticket offices, you take away that first point of contact. Now they, they say that they are going to have these people out on the platforms, but you know how hard it is to move about as a disabled person. Speaking from myself in my wheelchair, I'm very low down. I can't see where people are. People are getting in the way all the time. Am I gonna find someone? It adds a huge amount of stress and anxiety to an already anxiety inducing situation. Another thing that I would like to point out here is the people working in the ticket offices may be disabled or have some sort of impairment themselves which means that if their job is taken and made into a multi-use job and they have to be on the platform, is that going to be accessible for them? I speak from experience. I used to work in an office, then my job was consolidated into a multi-use job where I had to work on the shop floor and it turned out it just wasn't accessible for me and it was too much for me. And I feel like I was very much constructively dismissed. So what can we do to help make a change? Well. I know, it's hard work, isn't it, being disabled? We're writing letters left, right and central. Right, left, right and centre. But it's not just the ticket office, is it? There is so much more to it. And if you want to make your voice heard, you can write to your local MP, write to your local railway provider. There is a template on the Transport for All website, which I'll leave linked down below. So it's tried to be made as easy as possible for us. But the more we speak out about these issues, hopefully the more likelihood we have of some sort of change or more consideration when it comes to disabled travellers. I was filled with so much joy when I saw this. The German Sesame Street gets a new character. This is Erin. She loves to tinker with tech and like me, she talks a lot and will remain in Sesame Street to ensure that there is diversity and inclusion. I really love to see disabled characters portrayed in children's television because it really shows from a young age that disability is nothing to be scared about or um, awkward around and that, you know, they have as much 
right to be there as anybody else. Woo, wow, so that was a jam-packed episode of Disability News. I do hope that you have enjoyed this latest episode. Do let me know what you think down below. And if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe for the next episode. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Bye.